in the next few minutes, I will review some interesting EEG samples that you may find useful towards preparing for any of your EEG or neurology examinations. So let's get started. So this is the first slide here. Uh, if you are shown this slide on the EEG with this EEG sample, you'll have to identify what is the most striking findings here. So let me just give you a little bit of an introduction for those of you who are new to the EEG world. All the channels that end with the odd number are recording from the left side of the brain. Channels that end with the even number are recording from the right side of the brain. And channels that end with the letter Z are recording from the midline. The red line here is the ECG. So it is recording basically the ECG rhythm is being recorded here. Now, the green lines are separated by one second. As with any part of neurological examination, you compare the left side to the right side. So similarly, when you compare the left side here with the right side, you see an asymmetry. The amplitudes on the right hemisphere are lower than the amplitudes on the left side. There is also a mixture, a richer mixture of frequencies on the left side. Based on this EEG and the following page, this is the same uh, EEG, just an additional sample. What you can say is there is an asymmetry between the left and the right hemisphere. Whether it is the left side that is abnormal or the right side that's abnormal, it might be hard for you to say without a clear clinical history. If someone has a structural abnormality on the right hemisphere, you will expect to see lower amplitudes on that side. Likewise, if someone just has had a seizure coming from the left side, you can see post slowing on the left side. So you'll have to look at the clinical history in order to provide uh, a good uh, clinical correlation. What I would suggest is, uh, the important thing is look through the whole of the EG, look for asymmetries, look for reactivity, whether that is better seen on the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, and of course look for epileptiform discharges or sharp wave discharges. This is another patient. What you see here, this is the EG is being reviewed in a referential montage. What you see were the most striking findings are these sharp waves here. You see sharp wave discharges in the left temporal as well as in the left frontal head region. The highest amplitude seem to be in F7 uh, head region, which is anterior temporal or sort of a posterior frontal head region. At the same time, you see asymmetric slowing delta activity in the left hemisphere, both left temporal and left frontal head region. So when reporting this EG, you will say that this is an abnormal EG secondary to asymmetric slowing in the left frontotemporal head region along with sharp waves in the left frontotemporal head region. And in your clinical correlation, you will say that these findings are suggestive of a focal disturbance of cerebral function involving the left frontotemporal head region and a correlation with neuroimaging is recommended. You will also suggest that considering the sharp wave discharges in the left front temporal head region, this person is at a high risk of having ongoing seizures. Now, looking at this next EEG, what you see the most striking findings here are these sharp wave discharges that occur every second or every second and a half. These are seen in the left parasagittal region as well as the left temporal head region. These are what are, were previously called PLEDs. Now these are called periodic lateralized discharges. I would add that these are periodic, sharp, lateralized discharges. Uh, and when you see this kind of a pattern on the EG, this basically tells you that this person is at a high risk of having seizures. It also, you can see this kind of a pattern with herpes encephalitis. You can see in any kind of a subacute structural destructive lesion of the brain, so such as a brain abscess, you can see in an acute or subacute stroke, you can see in a post ictal state. So look up the causes for that pro, uh, give you PLEDs or periodic lateralized discharges on the EEG. This is a high yield question for neurology as well as EEG exams. This next page shows, so the next two, this one and this one, these both of these pages show you triphasic waves. So these are the triphasic waves right here. The triphasic waves can be seen in a number of conditions. I've highlighted the most common conditions 
associated with triphasic waves. So hepatic encephalopathy, uremia, CO2 retention, mixed edema coma, lithium toxicity, and anoxic brain injury are the common conditions that are associated with triphasic waves. I suggest that if you see triphasic waves, uh, consider checking for the ammonia level in that person. Hyperammonemia, as seen with hepatic encephalopathy, is associated with triphasic waves. Okay, so let's look at this case here. This is a 48-year-old man who presented to the emergency room acting strange for the past three days. He had a history of epilepsy but was not taking any anti-seizure medication for several years. On exam, he was able to tell the year but not the month and the date. He was able to follow one-step and two-step commands but had significant issues with his attention requiring frequent prompting. An urgent routine EG was requested at 6, 6 p.m. that night I was on call. So this is the first page of the EG. This is the second page here and I'll show you a few more samples, this one and the EG ends over here. So what we are looking over here is, this is something that's called spike and wave stupor. Patients may appear awake, patients may have some degree of awareness, so they are not quite there, but they may be able to interact. I treated this patient with intravenous load of valproic acid and the symptoms completely cleared up within a few hours. This is a different patient. What you see here on the EG is generalized spike and wave discharges. The frequency here is you see three spike and wave discharges per second. As you can see from the rest of the EG, patient is asleep. When you see generalized spike and wave and polyspike and wave discharges on the EEG, you suspect association with generalized epilepsy. This is another case. JM was a 29-year-old student at our university. He had a right temporal cavernous malformation. In the past, he was known to have focal unaware seizures. He reported being seizure-free for the past two years and wanted to drive. Since he worked mostly on his own in the lab and lived alone at home, I decided to request a 24-hour ambulatory EEG to get a better sampling. Now, the EEG revealed an electrographic seizure within the first 18 hours lasting 40 seconds. So let me show you the seizure. If you look over here on the first page, you can see the onset of the seizure coming from the right temporal head region. And the following pages is when the patient was actively seizing with some muscle artifact, and this is where the seizure ends. So the moral of the story here is when somebody tells you that they are seizure-free, it's a good idea to get a collateral history from family members or other witnesses. If somebody lives by himself or herself, it becomes quite challenging to be certain that a person is having focal unaware seizures because many patients are unaware of their unawareness. This next EEG shows response of the EEG in response to the photic stimulation. So the red lines at the bottom of the page here tell you that patient is undergoing intermittent photic stimulation. What you see here is what is called a photoparoxysmal response. So keep in mind that approximately 2 to 3% of individuals with focal onset seizures have are photosensitive. Approximately 15% of patients with generalized epilepsies are photosensitive. Approximately 35% of patients with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy are photosensitive. So something to keep in mind when uh, acquiring the EGs. This is a patient who had anoxic brain injury. An EG was done for prognosis. What you see here is generalized periodic discharges, also called GPEDs, with periods of suppression that last approximately one second or a bit longer. This is an EEG that was done 24 or 48 hours later and shows a burst suppression pattern. So these are the bursts and these are the suppressions. So burst suppression pattern in the context of anoxic brain injury when patient is not on any sedation is uh, considered a poor prognosis for functional recovery. So this patient had a subsequent EG in another 48 hours and shows very, very attenuated uh, amplitudes. So something to keep in mind in terms of uh, EEG changes with anoxic brain injury. This next EEG is from a six-month-old who was diagnosed with hypsarrhythmia. So his hypsarrhythmia basically 
refers to EEG, which is disorganized, has high amplitude, sharp waves, which are multifocal and associated with infantile spasm. So this is a six month old with hypsirhythmic EEG. What you see on this page is temporal intermittent rhythmic delta activity. This is just a sample, so you are not able to appreciate whether it is intermittent or continuous, but this patient had intermittent rhythmic delta activity in the left temporal head region. The presence of TERDA or temporal intermittent rhythmic delta activity is associated with temporal lobe epilepsy in 20 to 30% of the cases. The next EEG here, what you see here, this is also something that examiners like asking in different exams. What you see is an asymmetry in the eye blink artifact. You see eye blink artifacts in the left hemisphere. You do not see eye blink artifacts on the right hemisphere. So this person had a prosthetic right eye, and that is the reason you see an asymmetry in the eye blink artifacts. This next EEG shows EEG changes in a patient with Rolandic epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. These are the temporal spikes that are uh, that you can see here in the right temporal region. You can in fact see some in the left temporal head region as well. If you look carefully, you may be able to see something in the frontocentral head region. This is uh, a classic finding in patients with what was called benign Rolandic epilepsy of childhood, or you can call it a Rolandic epilepsy of childhood. This is a patient who had a rapidly progressive dementia. You see periodic discharges at a rate of one per second. This is a finding that can be seen in patients with CJD or Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is uh, a form of a rapidly progressive dementia. So a pattern that you need to recognize for your exams. So I hope this is uh, I hope this was useful for preparing for your neurology or your EEG exams. I thank you for your attention. A few things that I would remind from some of my previous tutorials is remember that EEG is the summation of excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So if somebody asks you what is an EEG, just don't respond that this is electrical activity of the brain. To sound like a medical student or a medical resident, you would want to say that EEG is the summation of excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. And if somebody asks you what is a cellular counterpart of an epileptic spike, keep in mind that it is the paroxysmal depolarization shift. Thank you very much for your attention. This is pretty much the end of the tutorial. I hope to see you in some of the future tutorials. Thank you.